welcome everybody to this fabulous, yet again, another fabulous show. And uh, this week we are going to be talking everything legal. And the best part is leases. Now, why specifically leases is because the lease is the strength of your acquisition. It's the strength of your property. And the lease inadvertently is going to dictate the value of your property. So I have a very, very special guest with me today. Um, whom we've met fairly recently, but Shasta and I have been doing quite a lot of work together. And the more we work together, the more we like each other. Well, I think she likes me. I don't know. I like her anyway. <laughs> um, Definitely not one-sided. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Shasta. So Shasta is the uh, principal lawyer uh, of Legally. And um, Legally is a boutique commercial law firm. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Shasta. Shasta, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Th thank you, Mish, for that lovely introduction. Uh, so, yes, I've been in the business for around 12 years now. Um, and seven years ago, I decided to start my own firm. I really wanted to do that because I love working with commercial clients and understanding where they want to be. So, I specialize in commercial transactive. And I think it's really important as a solicitor in that space to, to start out with your clients, asking them, where do you want to get to? How is this transaction going to help you to get there? And then I can better understand where my job is, um, not just protecting them legally, but also helping them reach their goals. So that was the main reason why I started my firm. And we're seven years strong now. So, yeah. And, and that this was actually amazing and, and Shasta, I must compliment you because you reached out to us at first and you were speaking to Angie initially and um, I was like, uh, you know, um, okay, let's see where this goes. <laughs> and, we one. <laughs> and you were incredibly tenacious and we eventually met up and uh, I just thought, wow, I love the way you work because you're communicative. Um, you love talking to your clients. You're very, you're very human about, you're a very human lawyer. Thank you. <laughs> so we really like that. Uh, and and we enjoy working with you. The same back to you, Mesh. I think it really works well because we, we work with our clients on the same level. So just like myself, you love speaking to your clients, you know, getting really involved in the DD um with properties and really understanding them so by the time it gets to me it's so much easier than transactions where you're not involved um mm. because half of the half of the work is sort of already done it's already laid out yeah and we like to do that I mean we like to dig deep and and make it as simple as possible and you know what I always say is uh in commercial acquisitions this is not a um single sport it's a team sport Mm -hmm. And the more we work together and share that information, you know, right across the board. So um, it really is uh, great working with people who love working with us. So Yeah, and I think with clients, they, they need those different touch points with different professionals. And it when it works and when it flows nicely, it makes a really nice experience for them from the client side. So that's what I'm feeling anyway from our <laughs> I think so. I mean, the, the, we've we've got quite a couple of deals going through you and I at the at the moment, uh, and I must say we have been so super impressed with um, how you've dealt with things, um, and uh, your team in in your office as well. Everybody have has only had really positive uh, feedback with regards um, how you deal with it, the conversations, the communication. This is all about communication, you know, and jumping onto issues straight away. So. Um, you've really been uh, re been on the ball with that. Uh, and I can tell you, we have been through solicitors and solicitors and solicitors and solicitors. And, um, you know, we're very picky about who we work with because we want that energy, that flow with, with and that communication. And I think when we first met, I said to you, um, you know, communication for me is absolutely key. It's all about transparency and we need to be on it. So thank you. I really want to thank you for um, <laughs> for pursuing me and <laughs> relentlessly. <laughs> relentlessly. I don't understand how people do the alternative. I don't understand how you can 
serve your client well as a solicitor and not communicate openly, frequently with all parties involved. To me, that just doesn't really make sense. So I have I see it done a lot on the other sides of transactions and it's harder. It's harder not to communicate. So no, it's yeah. great that we work the same way in that way. Well, you see, um, like attracts like. There we go. <laughs> So we are. We were talking about. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, fit outs and leases. Um, and we have um, recently had a couple of situations um, with tenants and fit outs. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got this in in three sections that um, we're going to be going through. And the three sections are basically tenanted funded, landlord funded, and share costs. Now. Um, Let's go through these in part so that we can help our audience understand what the difference is mm. and how it could benefit them. So the the, uh, the benefits and, of course, uh, the non-benefits in each case. Um, I've got my own my own point of view about it, but um, from a legal point of view, let's go through it. And what's your uh, opinion? Let's go. Let's start from tenanted funded. What yeah, do you so tenanted funded, I mean, there's pros and cons. So... The pros would be that you have a little, you tend to have more control. Um, and then the pro, the, the con of it, sorry, is that you've got a little bit, you've got financial expenditure and some risk in relation to controlling of the trades and timeframes and things like that. And I think it's important to remember, and you would see this a lot, is that landlords don't give you something for nothing. So a lot of the time what people don't, understand or what their lawyers aren't very good at explaining to them is that yes it, there can be some incentive to it but a lot of the time if it if it is um landlord funded it can funnel back into the rent payments over a term so with tenant funded I suppose that comes up as more of a pro because it tends to mean that the rent is more accurately priced I suppose uh over the when the landlord is funding something and putting that incentive yeah, um, yes and no. I mean, um, from our perspective, we really like tenanted funded um, uh, acquisitions. And mm. the reason we like tenanted funded is we know that, um, I'll give you an example, we were doing a, a property in Toowoomba and um, uh, some accountants, they uh, they actually did the fit out and the most beautiful fit out, they had the ceilings done and they had these beautiful shapes in the ceiling and down lights and carpets and, and all of this. And I mean, they had just spent over $150,000 in an office and we just took one look at it. Now, from our perspective, if we see the tenants are prepared to spend that amount of money in somebody else's building, well, that's a big investment, which means mm. that they're invested in staying there. Mm -hmm. So that immediately for us is tick, one of the great tick boxes, you yeah. know. Depending on how old the fit out is and how long the tenants have been there, this was actually um, the tenants had been there for about uh, 12 years and they had had this new fit out uh, installed probably about two years prior to us purchasing this property. And it was really lovely because we had the conversation with them and they were very invested in staying, but they wanted to make sure that their rental was um was accommodating obviously uh, market rental which was fabulous because we were getting market rental and they paid for the fit out you know to the so do, you, do you see mesh from your side of things because we obviously we deal with the same transactions but we see them from different sides do you see it where tenants do fantastic fit out and they, you know, so their rent is market rent without it being beautiful. They make it beautiful. And then when the market review comes time, do you see their rent go up in relation to how the the um, improvements that they've done with the property? Or does that not tend to happen on, on the negotiation side of things? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, if the, if the tenant's going to do a fit out and they're wanting the landlord to... Um, you know, uh, participate in the funding of that fit out. Generally, they would do it at the time and they mm -hmm. would advertise that into the rental somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. so they'd, they'd make an arrangement. And I think that's where you that's where you come with um, the the next section, which would be land, landlord funded or, mm -hmm. um, or shared cost. 
But generally, if we're purchasing a property and that fit out has already been done by the tenant um, and the, the rental is market relative, you know, there's no question about it, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yes. So, I mean, tenant funded is easy from a legal perspective. And then landlord funded, obviously, that's where we get involved a little bit more. And we usually see, we usually um, do incentive deeds. So, Explain that a little bit. What is incentive deeds? Yeah, yeah. So incentive deeds is basically a deed that sits alongside a lease that outlines some sort of incentive. And there is a commercial reason why landlords tend to do that rather than put the incentive in the lease. And that's because leases over three years long, including options, ought to be registered on title. So if we're thinking of you know, contracting with all different parties based on what the economy is doing at the time is going to change how you negotiate as a, as a landlord. So let's say, you know, with a certain person, you give them a certain amount of fit-out incentive. You might not necessarily want to do that in five years when the market's shifted. So if you put that incentive in an incentive deed, it, there's no need for that to be registered on title and open to the public. If you if you put it in the lease, everyone can see how you've negotiated that incentive and they're going to want the same thing if you're not offering them the same thing. So what do you see as the disadvantage? Because, I mean, when you say everybody's going to see that in the lease, why would that be at a disadvantage? If It's a disadvantage for the landlord if it's in the lease because if you no longer want to offer that incentive, they're going to say, oh, but you not one got that incentive three years ago. Why would I contract or why would I enter into a lease with you if I wasn't going to get the same? So that's that's one of the reasons why incentive deeds are used. And there needs to be careful drafting for both sides. So careful drafting for the landlord, but but careful reviewing from solicitors from the tenant's perspective. So I've got a good story about a landlord-funded uh, fit-out incentive, actually. And it, it could have ended quite badly for the client if the solicitor, if we had just ran over it and thought, great, you're getting 300000 for this for this fit out. That's fantastic. You don't have to pay for it. But on the terms of the fit out, so basically the story was that our client was entering into a lease for a cafe and it was in quite an upmarket area. So it required a pretty good fit out and it was a big space. So the landlord said, okay, I'll give you a $300,000 fit out incentive but with that what they failed to advise is that it was they didn't do it in stages and they weren't willing to pay for it up front so what the tenant would have had to what would have had to have been done if we didn't review and amend it would be that the tenant would have to front three hundred thousand dollars to the contractors builders electricians then provide the evidence to the landlord and then the landlord would have paid the incentive back and yes some people have 300,000 some tenants have that to put up yeah. but in our client's case he didn't he didn't want to move he didn't want to move his cash into that at that point the second thing that was a that we had to work on was that and it happens with a lot of incentive deeds is that they'll draft really strict, and I do the same thing, you draft really strict terms in relation to timeframes. So with this one, and we all know construction works at its own time frame, it's, you know, then they're not really going to care what your time frame under your incentive deed is. But the timeframes were really strict. And basically they could claw back the incentive deed if you didn't meet one of the timeframes of construction. So oh, not so only the landlord could claw back, could could claw back the, the incentive. Ah, okay. Yes. So then you're in a position where the client's stuck in a lease, yep. a large lease. They may have expended a certain amount of cash and then the incentive's clawed back, but the lease isn't terminated. So you're still stuck in the lease, Ouch. But, but you've now lost $300,000. So on that one, we really had to, it was hard negotiation too. They really didn't want to move on it. It took about three months of back and forth. Um, but where we finally got to was, okay, tenant, how much can you expend at certain times so that it's not going to affect your cash flow? And let's try and get them to, to agree to installments. And they did. At the end of the day, they agreed to the installments. So the tenant did have to fund sections of it or portions of it. And then the, and then the landlord would 
would refund them the amount. And then also we had to heavily negotiate on the timeframes. And it was it was just a matter of we can't put a client in this position with these timeframes where they're relying on a third party to do something within a certain amount of time. It's just, it's the risk to benefit ratio is way out. Yeah. So, so that was, that was successful, but you could see how quickly it could have gone bad if, if someone had just thought, yeah, that'll look fine. You've got just sign, sign your life away. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's so funny that you're telling us that story and uh, thank you for sharing that because <laughs> it's, you know, we, we often think, yep, that sounds good. Absolutely. Let's go ahead. Let's do that. And when you start getting into the nuts and bolts, and it's all about the money, you know, mm. you know this is this is nothing about the money, but it's all about the money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? 100%. And at the so end people of the get day, blinded. Yeah. And who pays what and when do they pay it? You know, that is that is exactly what we're doing all day, every day, you know, so it's the most important thing. So, mm -hmm. um just with on that um, landlord funding the reno, did they negotiate that the tenant was going to pay a proportional amount on their rental to cover and pay off the um, the three hundred thousand? No, not on the face of it. So it wasn't. It, yeah, no, it wasn't. Sort of a you pay this off as you go. It was really a this is a nice building, this is a dilapidated part of the building if you're willing to take this sort of term with this sort of rent. And, you know, most likely it was inbuilt somewhere. That's what I was saying before. And the tenant funded probably a bit early, but sometimes, you know, and you would understand this more from what is market, what is the market rent on it? You have to think, is it built in? Are they getting it back somewhere along the line? But it wasn't, it wasn't obviously sort of payable by the tenant at any stage. Well, that's pretty unusual. I mean, that must mm. be really unusual. And obviously the landlord could see the value, I'm assuming, mm. by by contributing, by uplifting his property. And I would love to know what the rental was because um, it, it, <laughs> it must have elevated his rental, <laughs> elevated his value, you know. Yes. You know? It was quite high. It would actually, and because we don't really get involved too much with the, with the you know, marketability of how, where the rent sits, yeah. It would be really interesting to sort of to have a discussion on that because I think even though they're not being obvious with it, they're not putting $300,000 in it for nothing. So usually, as, as you're saying, it would sort of flow through the rent over the term. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, if it's 300000 over a couple of months, uh, it's capital invested. Uh, I would imagine that the landlord is, is reallocating the rental straight into offset the uplift, which is taxable deduction. Uh, yeah. On the building itself, while you increase mm -hmm. the value, you you've got a depreciation value uh, and taxable taxable um, uh, income on their property. So for him, it's a win win. Okay, know? yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, now it's I know. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the day with my my accountant yesterday, and boy, <laughs> he was really giving me a a good old old um, uh, head banging about <laughs> you know. All these kind of of innuendos, they they're little innuendos, subtleties yeah. that yeah. Uh, you don't know, and you're not a seasoned investor, you wouldn't know how to do this stuff. So it's really, really fantastic. But anyway, and it's funny how we sort of look at it from our perspective. You know, I've got my legal goggles on when I'm looking at something, and and you would you would come from a different perspective. So it's really great having these conversations because it makes each other understand where we come from. You know, where yes. we're coming from and our thought process. Yes. And I can see by the way that we work. I mean, you you looking as you say, you're looking at your legal, you through your legal goggles. I'm always looking at value. I'm always looking yeah. at value, adding value. So it's lovely to to meet in the middle and see. Okay, hang on, wait a minute. If we do it this way, how are we going to be adding value? How are we going to be mitigating risk? You know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I think um, the next one that we've got is shared cost. Um, which again, I think is also quite a Thin line on um, on you know how do you share cost? What are the values? Um, and how do you come to a value, or how do you come to a budget to share that cost? And this is where we usually find the cracks start appearing. <laughs> I've got another great story. I'll, I'll whip that out if you like. <laughs> <laughs> whip it out. Tell me your great stories. I love them. <laughs> my battle, my battle stories. Um, 
So we had a client that was a, a small business. It was a really small business. Um, she was wanting to go into a new building that was being developed that was promising a lot, a lot of foot traffic, et cetera. And they had offered a certain amount of incentive to contribute to a fit out. And it was something quite nominal in relation to a fit out. So about $15,000. But in the incentive deed, the conditions were wild. So to in order to get that 15000 the level at which she had to have the fit out was just astronomical, like all marble, proper marble benches and just <laughs> the level of the finishes. When she'd sort of quoted it out, because I said, look, I'm not a builder, I'm not a shop fitter, but this is so much over what you'd see as standard and they're being really particular with how they want you to do this. It would be my advice that you speak to a shop fitter and say, okay, realistically, how much is this going to cost with these level of fixtures and fittings? It ended up being like three times the amount of a normal fit out. And you had to have their, their trades who were specialized large commercial trades, which we all know are going to cost much more than, you know, your normal shop fitter. Yep. And their architect briefed through the whole the whole process wow and so when she weighed it up I mean you're getting 15,000 which is a drop in the ocean when you're thinking about fitting something out she's got a relatively small business I think it was like a gelato shop or an ice cream shop or something like that you know it's not going to be huge turnovers Mm -hmm. so the incentive looked great from the outset of someone just saying we'll give you 15,000 for nothing but the conditions to which she would have to meet to get that fit out it made it so much more expensive than to just do your own fit out, basically. Way up, they just don't way up. Uh, yeah. What it, just the end of the story? Did she end up moving in? Did you end up having to negotiate them back? Um, so we we tried to negotiate, and the terms on that were just not commercial. Uh, and I mean, I think it was such a sought after new sort of area that they didn't care. But there was, you know, usually we'll go back, there'll be anywhere between, on an average lease review, there'll be anywhere between like five to 15 things. And some of them can be really little and niggly, you see what, what we do and some things, big things, and you sort of weigh up, okay, what do I, what do I want to prioritize here? There were like pages of issues <laughs> with this lease. So we oh. sort of got to the point <laughs> where we attempted to negotiate quite heavily. They were not having a bar of it. We just had to sit down with the client and say, this doesn't make sense from a commercial perspective. And as lawyers talking about numbers, we have absolutely no business doing that ever. <laughs> but, uh, um, that's yeah. The, that's the point at which you just say, I'm throwing it in the too hard basket. Move on. This, yeah. this site is not for you. There's another one down the road. Really? And I'm I'm so glad that she did say no because I I genuinely think she wouldn't have had capacity to be able to meet the obligations under the lease. What they were asking for was pretty outrageous. And you see so many clients that you know you give them quite strong advice and you can't tell someone, look, I don't. This is a really bad idea. You can't do it. They're obviously going to make their own mind up about it. But I was really glad in that situation that she did take the advice and say no. I'm actually really glad, yeah. really glad I didn't do that. Yeah. That's, that's that's my job. When I have a look at something like this and I say, uh uh-uh, this is we put it <laughs> in a too hard basket, move on. You know, seriously, yeah. we we can we can weigh up all the odds and I always say, you know what, we we will find the red flags, we'll identify the red flags, and if they get to a point where they are just too hard uh and not worth pursuing, that's it. Move on. Okay. Let's let's find you something else and you know, put you in something else that is more palatable. Because there will be something that fits. And I think that's why I love working with you on Deals Mesh because it makes my life easy because I say, right, here are all the legal issues. This is what I think. And Mish will definitely tell you if it's worth it or not. <laughs> then you get to be the guy that says, we're not going with this. <laughs> I think I'll be known not to mince my words. I'll just say it like it is. <laughs> Happily so. Next time. <laughs> no, absolutely. But um yeah, I mean, uh, on that, that share cost thing, we, we inherited a lease when we bought a building a little while ago. Um, long story short, it was also a, a small cafe uh, type shop, very nice little fit out um, and uh, got to the end of the lease and the tenant didn't want to renew, but he did want to renew and there were, there were argy-bargy. 
Long story short, I think the, um, the property manager who was managing their property at the moment wasn't one of our managers. We inherited uh, the manager and um, he really had a fallout with this tenant in particular for a number of, I kind of saw it as two egos clashing. Yeah. I thought, oh boy, I better get in between here. Uh, which which <laughs> didn't help Can that. Fix this? <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, what had happened is the landlord had fitted out, um, had done the fit out. The tenant had moved in, but the tenant had been charged uh, a premium for the fit out. Yeah. So when he came to the end of his rental, he felt that he owned that fit out. The manager disagreed. Obviously, I was saying, let's see how we can accommodate and, and meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, the the tenant just he just he just cracked one day. Uh, and the next morning when we went to have a look at the building, everything had been blacked out. When we opened the door, he had ripped everything out of the shop right down to the naked concrete. He oh wow. Ripped the floor tiles up, he'd ripped the wall tiles up. And this, it was I was seething. I was absolutely yeah, because I mean that really belonged to the building, and yeah. the manager should have been on top of that. You know, he should yeah. have taken his ego out of it. Anyway, so so <laughs> so the lesson in that is, you know, uh, when something like that happens, um, it's all about negotiation. It's all about communication. It's all about doing things right and jumping in at the right time, having the right people on board to be doing, you know, this kind of thing. So that was a little bit of a, a, a painful experience, but. Because I, I feel like though in that situation when he when he set out with the lease or took over it or what have you, if the solicitor was reviewing that, so that's one of the main things you talk about with your clients, you know, okay, so this was here, but you've, you know, paid for it. This is what happens at the end of the lease. And then I usually find with clients, if they know what to expect, there's not as much argy bargy or this is unfair because they're going into it with that expectation. Whereas if the advisors are quite quiet on things or maybe overlook things, it's when that expectation, they're, com they're at complete odds with each other. Like everyone knows what the lease says, but the tenant thought one thing and yeah, that can be difficult. Absolutely. And again, what you're talking about over there is communication. You know, it's yeah. just being, being transparent and, um, uh, realistically, after when this happened, um, I was fuming mad about it, and I just I terminated the management. I said that's it because you do not deal with people in this way. You know, we we're not in the in the practice of destroying relationships. Um, it's totally un, uncalled for. So we terminated the management and took over the management of the building ourselves. But you're absolutely right. You know, mm. it's, it's advising them, asking them. You know um uh what they want how we can how can we negotiate how can we work something out so that's a win-win situation 100 percent. and managing expectations is so important from the outset of any sort of transaction especially leasing but yeah absolutely right and i think you know we do commercial dispute work as well and one of the first things i say to my clients is where do you want to be where do you tell me what it looks like for you at the end of this matter and that's where you really understand how to advise. Because if someone's saying, oh, I want to go to court, I'm right. You know, I don't care about anything. I don't care about the money. It's really important for me to be right. You're going to take a different stance in relation to your advice and your strategy than if someone says, I need to be out of it for this much. You know, I'm cost sensitive. I've already lost quite a bit of money. It's two different ways of going about things. So I think being a bit more collaborative, well, being collaborative with your clients can really help situations like that, ho hopefully. <laughs> oh, yes, I think that is, I think that is a very sensible way of doing things. And I love the way you're saying, look at the end first, you know, what the outcome is. Because as you say, you have, you have so many different people, you know, um, and people in different places at, uh, you know, different times. I think that's, that's, um, that's a very sensible way of looking at it. You know, of and the lawyers win, you know, 
as lawyers, you know that. So, and I think that's a really important thing for clients to know. So if you fight it out, it, it's going to be messy. If that's the case, you know, it's going to be long-winded. The lawyers win and it will cost you a lot of money. And if it's really important for you to be right, you might not mind. You might yeah. not mind if the lawyers win financially, but if you're the latter, then that you're not going to be satisfied at the end of that. And I think that's important for your advisors to know where you stand. And uh, sadly, a lot of advisors sort of go from it the other way. Like, let's start here and see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> Everyone's going to private school. I <laughs> know, oh, that's awesome. Um, so um, just moving on with regards to negotiating a, a fair fit out. Uh, we've touched on it a little bit. Uh, with regards, um, you know, starting out the negotiation right from the beginning, and I think you've pretty much said it, you know, mm -hmm. assessing the individual's needs and their priorities, considering the, the financial capabilities and constraints, um, and then be open to the com compromise and the collaboration. Um, there's a great story that um, we, we, we purchased a property. It was a super cheap property in a fantastic area, and um, the the client uh, went door knocking to find the perfect tenant because it was semi semi vacant and we were um, working with them all the time long story short he um he got a medical uh company to come in into that that building um and he bought the building for about 500 odd thousand uh and he was he was saying to me mish oh they wanted two hundred and fifty thousand fit out but i only paid five hundred thousand for it and I sat down with them and I said to him, mate, let's just have a look at the numbers here. Firstly, are they prepared to pay you for that fit out? And he said, yeah, yeah, they're prepared to sign a five by five. So I said, OK, let's amortize those figures over that period of time and see if they're prepared to pay for that rental. So mm. if you pay that up front, you've got equity in the, in, uh, in the building, you pay that up front and you can charge them and uncharge them interest um, mm. over a period of time. And how much would that value your building? Long story short, uh, the quick version is <laughs> he eventually went along with it, but it was a lot of argy bargy and a lot of counselling from my side to, uh -huh. you know, just help him get in and negotiate with the, um, it was a, a national tenant, uh, medical, yeah. and negotiating with them and they put up a, a good, that can be um, hard. good but battle. Um, yeah. You know, that rental quadrupled, which means that the value of the property quadrupled. Mm -hmm. In six months, that property was valued at three times more than when he bought it. You know, so fair fit out, fair trade, fair negotiation. It took three months, three to four months to negotiate that. Wow. And so do you find that when you sit down and explain it, because it makes perfect sense to me now, it's pretty logical that that is a good way to go. Mm. When you sit down and sort of give that advice, do you find most people will come around and say fantastic or are people still pretty sensitive on the topic? Look, it depends on their personal their personal circumstances because, you know, not everybody's got 250K lying around that they can chuck in. In this, this case in particular, I said to the guy, look, just make it happen. You know, find it wherever you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Do a, a line of credit off your PPR or um, just, you know, sell your BMW if you need to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which my clients have done before <laughs> to finance something but they can see <laughs> I've got one client that keeps on buying all these these um fancy sports cars and every time we do we, do, we purchase a property for him he says to me oh Mish I'm gonna have to go and sell my RX3 <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine you out front of his house like taking the photos <laughs> I'm like, if you want another property, we're selling this beast. <laughs> yeah. And I always say to him, I, I always say to him, mate, have a look at the difference, appreciating asset or depreciating Depreciate, asset. Yeah, yeah. Which one do you want? You know? They're like, look how fun it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I said to him, once you have this property, you can buy five of those. <laughs> yeah. Until you want another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think just answering your question is very dependent on the individual um, and often what we do is we sit down and we have a look at the projection of what what the value is going to be, what it means, how it's going to work, what the time frame is um, and how we're going to roll that out 
And essentially, as you so rightly said, what is the end game? So what are you trying to achieve? Go and look at it now. Look at it in three years' time or five years' time, you know. Um, and where's, where is this little investment going to take you on the journey? Yeah. And then you'll find which way, you know, it's quite easy then to decipher which way you go with things. Yeah. And I, yeah, I always find that the easiest thing to do, understand where they want to be, and then the negotiations will sort of follow. Yeah. So from a from a, a leasing point of view, um, what do you what do you recommend um, would would be you know at which point do you recommend uh, a fair fit out? Um, uh, do you have a look at their their financial capabilities, or do you just look at at legals and how they can how they can lock this in legally? We tend to be quite. It tends to be quite tunnel vision, really. And now that you say that, I'm realizing like I'm so collaborative. But we, I suppose, we need to be careful with financial advice, obviously, because we're licensed and heavily governed and things like that. So, it, within my practice, I suppose that's all I can I can speak for. I really do look at their capabilities in relation to what they can afford, in relation to what the agreement states. I suppose is the first thing. Okay, so they're saying this are you going to be able to service that basically? And then obviously the end goal comes into consideration. Okay, where do they want? Like I want a beautiful fit out. I'm doing a high-end, I don't know, beauty salon or something like that. Okay, well, this is a cold shell. So where is that going to come into it? If you want this beautiful fit out, yet they're not willing to contribute anything at the moment and you don't have the cash up front, how is that going to work? So again, it's all that communication piece and understanding what people have versus what they need. Then you figure out the advice and the negotiations that need to happen to, to hope to get them as close to their goal. Because like we know with clients, they can have these beautiful visions and a lot of the time they're just not reality. So it's about coming back down to reality and thinking what is commercial in these sort of instances and trying to get as close to that as we can. Yeah, well, that sounds that sounds reasonable. Tell me something as a matter of interest. When um, when we do these acquis these acquisitions and we go through the leases and we see fit outs and that often we see um, that maybe the fit out is a little bit tired, but it's it's in the lease um, or um, it hasn't been prop properly articulated as in who keeps the fit out, who's paying for it. Uh, what the end goal is. Do you make any suggestions when you are analysing those leases at acquisition? Yes. So, and it really depends on what's in there and what the client has negotiated. So, if they, if it's a tenant funded fit out and they are happy, like for instance, with my own lease, I funded the fit out, but I didn't want to have to remove it because it was going to be of no benefit to me. So I didn't want to make good on it. And it added to, it was an office and it was a boardroom. So it added to the property. So I negotiated with the landlord that I'm going to put it in, I'll fund it. I don't really want you to put constraints on me and it worked, which was good, um, but I'm not going to get rid of it. So when we leave, you know, if if the rest of the building needs to be repainted or whatever, I'll, I'll do all that make good but I'm not removing that boardroom. And they were really happy with that, obviously, because it, it added value to their property. But it really depends. So if they want to be removing things that if they've funded it, then that's what we'll try and negotiate into lease. But it's always something that we consider and speak about. And the advice really depends on whether they've funded it, whether the landlord's funded it, what they what they want to be doing at the end of it. Because if you don't want to be removing things at the end of it, then we need to negotiate, obviously, before you sign. And people don't think about that. A lot of the time when people come to us for lease advice, we're getting it a lot at the moment where it's like the market's really tight. I have no choice. I need to go with this. I just need you to sign this advice report if it's retail or I just want someone to skim over it. Well, we don't do that. <laughs> we sort of stop them slow down and say start as you mean to finish because this it seems like it's all the stress and a worry and a rush at the moment but if you don't negotiate good terms into this lease you if it's got an initial term of 10 years you are stuck with those bad terms for 10 years so it is you know it's a, it's a serious thing and I think people do tend to to rush it so yeah with the negotiations it is really important to get them right from the outset and 
That's why I think we, so with our lease reviews, we do full written reviews and then we sit down and have meetings with our clients in relation to the points where we just don't think they should stick with or things that we think, okay, let's see if we can get this over the line. And then they're really well educated about the contents of it. And I think if people know what to expect, they're less likely to blow up about a dump track. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, with with regards when you are purchasing a property and you have a, a lease that is relatively undesirable and it has points about, you know, sticking points in it. I mean, recently you and I have been working on a on a, a lease that had no bonds, no bank yes. guarantees. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's absolutely no security on this uh, on this acquisition whatsoever. Um, and I know I've stuck my heels in quite a couple of times and just said, well, you know, then we want a price reduction, you know, yeah. and they, they need to accommodate. How do you find working with something like that? I mean, from a legal perspective, it's really interesting for me and I like to get good outcomes for my clients. So I just hope at the outset that, I, that we're able to do that. <laughs> um, with that one in particular, it was quite interesting because you came up with, the obviously the commercial idea of okay we'll just um Not reduce the purchase price yeah and I think what it can obviously they came back and said no we're not doing that I think on most points but what was interesting about that one and maybe I did put my mish hat on a little bit on that one and I don't know maybe you'd already you'd probably you would have most likely already said it to the client but when you thought about the value of the property and then you thought about the risk the potential risk of tenants breaching and not have any security for it I think the, sec the security is all up for about ninety thousand dollars so when the client put that into perspective in relation to you know the financial benefit of the deal going through, the risk wasn't as big as it initially felt like. Because from a legal perspective, we're going, whoa, red flag, red flag, what's happening, red flag. But then it's important as a solicitor to sit down and go, okay, well, yeah, legal red flags, that's okay. But that's not the end of the conversation. So what does that mean from a financial perspective, from a risk perspective? What would change if we had those things in place? And how much of a benefit are you getting by getting the property at this price or that price and they ultimately ended up thinking well no that's worth it and it's worth yeah. pursuing that and and that's the reason why i brought this up is because it's very much a matter of risk and reward and 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 you can't look at things in a in a singular perspective you have to look at the entire gestalt you know mm -hmm. of, the, of, of what is being presented so the tenants the relationship with the tenants the type of leases the whales um the cost, the the cost per square meter. You know, we we look at we look at all of that and throw them in and say, well, on the whole, do we have more thumbs up or do we have more red flags? You know, yeah. and if, and if we can solve uh, ninety percent of those problems, I think at the end of the day, we 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 solved every single problem bar one. Yeah. <laughs> on this entire. How good did we do? <laughs> <laughs> I think we did damn well. <laughs> <laughs> I think we did incredibly well. Yeah, I was, yeah, that was a good that was a good transaction actually because um, from from a financial perspective, obviously you wouldn't have gone for it if it wasn't um, fantastic for the client. And then I and I don't know if before I've, I was working with you, you know, in the capacity that we do now, if I necessarily would have gone to that first as in that thinking of okay well let's let's weigh it up because you do just as a lawyer have your legal hat on a fair bit yeah a bit of tunnel vision so yeah and that's what's lovely about working with you uh Shasta, because because you you're open to hearing our perspective and we're always going to come in with the as the as the buyer um looking at how many options you know we can present and uh to be quite honest with you i always say that my job is all about finding a solution you know, uh -huh. I'm, I'm yeah. all about finding a solution. How can we find a solution and meet in the middle? You know, so uh, you handled that incredibly well. And every time we threw something else at you, you just said, right, let me take it to them and, and <laughs> let's, let's close it. Let's, you know, you never pushed back and said, no, 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 awesome. you were great. <laughs> and we had someone that wasn't responding. So that's always a little bit of um, oh, excitement, a little yes. sprinkle on top. <laughs> Let's not go there because we have those in, on every deal. <laughs> we'll uh, do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, absolutely, it's all about collaboration. It's not what you do, it's how you do it, I think. Um, 
Uh, and, and somebody said to me the other day, what do, I, what do I enjoy most about my job? And I said, it's probably the negotiations. I love yeah. the negotiations. I love achieving um, a common ground that is, um, that, is that, that everybody feels as if they're winning, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and having the, that, that good backup behind us, like yourselves and the finance and, and, and the valuations and all of that, you know, it's, it's a good outcome at the end of the day. Um, 100% because if you don't have that, you know, you might be doing your piece really well and we both would have experienced this if you're, and it's not that people are bad at, at their jobs or what they're doing, but their way just might not gel with your way. And yeah. so I think at the heart of it, we both have collaboration and communication and commercial viability is three of our pillars. But if people don't have that and they're working a little bit differently to you, it kind of just puts kinks in the process, I suppose. And that's hard for the client. It does. It does. And I mean, sometimes I've got to step back and just say, okay, I'm prepared to learn. I'm prepared to learn what you are, you know, more proficient on. And uh, maybe I don't have the, 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 the experience or the knowledge. And that is where um, somebody like you comes in, you know, you, you, you um, are the legal um, representative in this instance. And I'll offer step back and just say, hey, uh, Shasta, what do you, you know, from a legal perspective, what can we do here? How can we, how can we, um, you know, move forward? So, and it is, it is so refreshing. And I think backing for, to the other side from that sort of commercial viability perspective, it's so nice to be able to lean on you. But you do get a lot of professionals that don't really want to open up in that way. So you'll say, look, these are the legal risks. And they'll say, well, just glaze over that because the client needs to buy. <laughs> It's like, oh, can't play over it. <laughs> Pretty salient point. <laughs> oh, yes. We've, we've, we've come across quite a lot of clients who have come to us and, and uh, they say to us, oh, but that's not the way that the previous buyer's agents did it or whatever. And I just say, well, you know what? Um, if you want to get stung, then go for it. But yeah. this is the way that we do it, you know, we're going to yeah. we're gonna uh, dig deeper and uncover all of those uh, red flags and and work on them basically because mm -hmm. um, a lot of money when you're purchasing one of these properties. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So there's um, with regards to all of this, um, we we it kind of takes us into repairs and maintenance. Um, and I've always been fairly defined about repairs and maintenance that um, that is generally for the landlord. Mm -hmm. depending on whatever the uh, if it's building and construction and it's something that we look for in the lease straight away we say okay if it's the structure then it's for the landlord um, mm -hmm. and if it's internal then it's for the tenant but sometimes there is a little bit of a uh, graying of that space have you ever seen that yeah and I see it um not so much as like inside outside but capital expenditure so expecting tenants to you know replace all the air conditioners and, and things like that, or um, where else have we seen it? The, uh, an interesting one that's coming up quite a bit lately is where if the tenant wants to do anything, and I mean like, oh, minor, minor fit out stuff, the landlord will say things like, oh, well, if it's found that everything's completely illegal, um, you're liable for that like as in what they've already done so the property as it sits even if a tenant wants to do anything like construct a wall between two offices they'll they'll say okay well if we get a show cause notice for anything that we did prior to you doing that work you're now liable for everything and you have to make good the premises until it's up to scratch and ticked off by the council which I thought was really interesting I don't know if you've seen that come up but we've been seeing it come up quite a bit um, I would I would get uh, asked uh, how to deal with something like that. And I always say, look, you know, um, make open communication. Again, it comes back to communication and expectation. And as you so, so rightly said, what is the end goal? So mm. I always look at everything as in um, exit, you know, what happens at exit and um, how are we going to negotiate this? Mm -hmm. So um, it's a little bit... Uh, of of defining exactly what the scope of works are, who's responsible for that, who wants it, how they're going to pay for it, is it internal, are they going to take it with them, as you said, like you know, doing your own little boardroom, um, and and being a hundred percent clear on um, 
you know, what your make good is. Are you going to re remove that when you move out of there? Um, and getting clarity from both parties and, of course, making it legal. So if there are any changes whatsoever, and I think from my perspective, I always say this is a legal binding document. If mm. you can make any changes willy nilly, you need to understand if it's not in your legal binding document, what is your expectation at exit? Yeah. So consult with your lease, number one. Number one, what does your lease say? And number two, whose responsibility is it? And if it needs to be documented, who's going to do that? And it comes back to that communication piece, doesn't it? If people know what to expect, they're not going to get shocked. But a lot of the time, leases are templates at the end of the day. And the lawyer will usually sit there and be like, oh, that sounds good. Let's pop that in. Let's take that out. Let's pop that in. <laughs> I mean, I don't do that much, but a lot of people do. But Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> telling industry secrets. But a lot of the time, you know, most of us that, that work in this commercial transactive area have been doing it for a while. We know what's industry standard. And you can usually, I like to do it by phone call. Obviously, I put it in writing, but to me, it just is a bit easier to say, come on, <laughs> we know this is not normal. Let's pop these things out. And they always do. They just, it's giving a red hot go usually yes, so absolutely i mean uh, when 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 they bring these problems to me i always say to them listen just put it in writing so everybody knows sign it off so that the landlord signs it off the tenant signs it off and you know exactly what to expect at the end of the day and it's 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 often it's often issues like as you say um additional air conditioners it's carpets it's you know um fitting uh dry walls on the inside of buildings yes. that sort of thing and you know tenants just go ahead and do it <laughs> you know and then come the end of the day and they read their lease and it says make good well what does make good mean <laughs> yeah what it's always good to get that call so I've ripped out the whole entirety of the building um was I allowed to do that like no no you weren't allowed to do that but okay <laughs> thank you for telling me first ripping out of the building yeah so Shasta on that point you know, if somebody does that um, and landlord has a look at it and says, whoa, hang on, what have you done here? How do you solve that problem? From the tenant's perspective or the landlord's perspective? I and and landlords, I mean, if, they, if they're at odds, that they've got different opinions. Landlord's ripped out whatever he wants to. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the tenant's ripped out uh, internals, internal walls and that. He's now mm. vacating. Um, saying to landlord, yeah, well, it suited us. We needed we needed to do that for our building. Landlord mm. saying, well, you didn't ask me. Um, mm. Now we've got a difference of opinion. How do you how do you negotiate that? How do you you know landlord saying, oh well, I need to build that back and it's going to cost fifty thousand dollars. Mm. Uh, tenants at the end of the lease and he's saying, well, buggy you, I'm out of here. Um, how do you deal with that? I mean, one, build good relationships with whoever's on the other side because favours can always come in handy. But really, the lease is going to determine whether you could or couldn't do something. So you're either going to know whether your clients and the right are in the wrong pretty soon after looking at the relevant clauses. And I think from there, it really is about that communication piece. So, you know, ringing whoever's representing the other side if your client is in the wrong saying, look, it's obvious, like, no one's pretending that our client didn't do something that they, you know, shouldn't have done. And if, you, if you've got a tenant that's saying, well, um, I don't think I did wrong. I, I, I paid for that. It belongs to me. And I mean, yeah. like, like, like our tenant that uh, ripped out the internals, the guts of the cafe, he said, well, I paid for it. So, you know, stuff you and he walked, he, off he walked. Now, mm -hmm. uh, could we have pursued him for legal fees? Could we have uh, laid charges against him? Could we have laid theft charges against him? You know, yeah, it depends. It depends on the lease then. So if if he wasn't allowed to do that, or he was, you know, specifically stated what he had to do at the end of the lease, which most likely wouldn't have been rip out the rip out the fit out. <laughs> then you could pursue him for that in relation to your your damages because like you're saying the lease is a legally binding contract between two parties so hopefully it was clear on the terms and if it wasn't then yeah I mean both both ways are going to end up in a dispute if it's going to cost the landlord a lot of money but then from the landlord's perspective you've always got to be realistic with these things when you're when you're looking at lease disputes because 
if you're going to chase this person for, you know, I don't know, 100 grand, yeah. do they have 100 grand? Because well, if they don't have any money, you're you're throwing good money after bad. And that's obviously a, a, a judgment call with some DD, but it depends on so many different factors, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. And there again, this is this is the value of analyzing that lease uh, mm. when you are when you're purchasing a property. You know, um, uh, really, really drilling down, perusing that lease in detail, and knowing what the risks are when you're purchasing that property. And I have to just throw this in there because we've done this on on a number of occasions where we've picked up a couple of little nuances in the lease. Uh, or irregularities in the lease, and we've taken it back to the seller, and we've just said to them, hey, you know, this lease is not worth the paper that it's written on, and for this reason, that reason, whatever, and and just saying to them, you know, it, it, it leaves, um, I'll give you an example. <laughs> um, we were looking at a, at a lease that was, um, it was a, a three by five, and it was coming up for, uh, it had about four years to run on the lease, and um, on page three, clause clause seven point eight point three point two point one, it was really, 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 really hidden in these little clauses, you know, sub, 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 that little fine print that said that the that the tenant could give three months termination um uh a period on the lease. And yeah. I kind of look at this and I said, Well then what's the value of the lease? There is none. Was it what I've worked on one similar with you where they where <laughs> someone tried to pull that? There's yes. no value to that lease. You've got maximum three months value. And if it was the one I'm thinking of, there was no security either, no personal guarantee, and it wouldn't have mattered anyway because they can just elect to terminate it with two weeks' notice or something, I think it was. It's outrageous. Absolutely. And there again, there is the value of your lease. You know, If you're not having a good legal eye perusing those leases, you could be walking into a hornet's nest without you even knowing. And I think even if, make sure that whoever is advising you understands your communication style. So to cover all bases, I like, like I've already said, I like to put it in writing so that, because some people really like to delve deep and see everything. And our lease reviews are usually about 11 pages long. Like we really go into detail about this is the clause, this is how it could affect you, this is what we could do to get around it. But then I also sit down and have a meeting with them. And I'm not going to bore them to tears and have a two-hour meeting, but the, the really important parts that I think we need to negotiate that could prejudice them, sit down and talk to them about that. Because a lot of people will think, oh, I've had a lawyer look over it. So surely they wouldn't let me go ahead if, if it wasn't a good thing. Well, no, there's probably a lot of advice in that letter that you need to discuss. And, and it most likely they need to explain to you how it's actually going to affect you. And I think that's why the written and verbal meeting is so effective mm -hmm. because most people are reasonable. And if you can sit there and say, look, I think that, you know, this could end in this way. And if, if people have different appetites for risk and that's okay, but if your appetite isn't, you know, that big, then that's not a good thing to have in there. And I really think we need to go back. And I think a lot of the time advisors tend to, write and not talk and that can be the difficulty where oh well I told you oh I didn't read that letter I thought you would have run me if there was anything really wrong so yeah. just making sure that your communication style matches that of your advisor is so important and making sure that you feel comfortable to ask them things if you're not sure absolutely ask I always say ask and if you're not sure ask and if you're not sure ask and if you're not sure ask again if you understand something well enough, you should be able to explain it quite simply, you know, and that's what I try and live by. If, if I can't explain something simply, I obviously need to look into it a bit further because obviously I don't understand it enough. So if your client's continuously asking the same question, as an advisor, it's important to sit back and think, how am I explaining this and is it effective? Because if they don't understand what you're telling them, how can they instruct you properly, you know, it's, Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. You got to find their language and, and 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 talk their language at the end of the day. Um, there's just something that a little segue over here that um, sometimes we get right, not always, is when we when we um, purchasing a property and we see anomalies like this in a lease. I would often take that back to the vendor and just say, look, you know, um, I'm happy to go ahead with this. However, 
um, we're going to have to renegotiate the lease. So, so prior to us going to settlement, we would want a new lease, you know, mm. and the reason why we're wanting a new lease is for, um, you know, this reason, that reason, that reason. Often, often um, when we're having the, um, we do the tenant interviews, I would speak to the tenant or my team would speak to the tenant and we just say, you know what, this lease is actually flawed and it leaves you wide open. Uh, we would rather give you some form of security mm. uh, and you can actually negotiate that at that point. And I think that's people so think interesting. I didn't know that your service sort of delved into that, which makes a lot of sense because when we're working on matters together and I'm putting forward like lease amendments with leases that are already entered into, these people don't have to agree to these amendments. And they are because obviously they can see the benefit because it's been explained to them from both sides. Yeah. And I mean, if, if um, you know, often those leases are very skewed to the tenant's advantage, but if, if we can find common ground where, um, and if the tenant is reasonable enough that they can see, uh, and, if, and, and particularly if they want to stay on, then uh, we would um, ask them to cancel the existing lease and renegotiate a new lease. Or we renegotiate a new lease and, and simultaneously cancel and, and reinstate. So we have done that from time to time. Um, mm. There have been instances where there's, um, you know, assets, um, a building assets that have been in the wrong, um, they belong to the vendor instead of belonging to the building, for argument's sake. Yeah, okay. So we've changed that up and the tenants, you know, and it depends who, you, who you're dealing with. It's all about negotiating um, mm. and, and being transparent about it and communicative and, um, you know, just doing those um, improvements um, and discussing. It's always about discussing the exit. And I think most of the time, if you've got a flawed lease, it's usually flawed in some way for both parties. So like you're saying, saying, well, we, you know, it's flawed this side for us but it's also not great for you in this way so yeah. if we renegotiate and obviously they're half of that negotiation then it's usually going to be better for them anyway but it is like it's letting them know that yeah and I mean if they can see the value in it and if it's mutual value you know if you're trying to renegotiate the lease and you try and put everything on them well you know don't expect to have a win-win outcome mm. but I think if it's, if it's um you know, if there's value for both parties moving forward in the same direction and continuing good, solid business, you know, it's um, one hand scratches the other one's back and vice versa. It makes sense, yeah. 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 You know, so it's, it really is uh, expecting the uh, the outcome to be good for both parties. Tips for success, successful negotiations. I mean, we've been talking about a hell of a lot of, of, of hints and tips uh, and this has been a great conversation, by the way. I'm really enjoying chatting to you, Shasta. <laughs> we got to do this more often. <laughs> we do, we do. <laughs> and I think we pretty much covered it. Uh, you know, open com communication, being honest, focusing on mutual benefits, uh, and being prepared to compromise. And I think that's a very big one. Mm. You know, both sides compromising. Um, and in fact, the the, the legal the, the recent acquisition that we've been doing, I won't mention where it is, but I think there's been a lot of negotiation and a lot of compromise that's come from both sides. Yeah. And in fact, we've had a very difficult selling agent. Yeah. And, and we've actually just gone right over his head to the actual seller himself, who's a really nice guy and open and willing to, <laughs> to negotiate. Yeah. And I think it's all about, what I talk to my clients a lot is, you know, and we talk to our friends and children and so on about this, but pick your battles. What's important to you? So there might be 10 things that you don't like about it, but if there's one that is a real sticking point, try and get that over the line. You know what I mean? Don't try and fight on every single thing. Because like you're saying, it's a negotiation. There's compromise from either side. So really focus on what is what is the most important thing to you out of these things that, you know, aren't that great and what can you let slide? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, we've got uh, just a recap of the key takeaways. Uh, and I think we, we're probably repeating ourselves here, but um, let's just run through them. And that is understand common fit out, uh, who pays for it, what the, origin, what, the, what the arrangement is, what it looks like at exit, uh, who gets what, uh, and be open to that negotiation to clear up uh, clauses for repairs and maintenance and responsibilities. 
um, consider various ends of the lease scenario and again negotiate reasonable terms. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? Is there is there anything that we've missed um, that could help our listeners? I think we've just done a fantastic job of covering it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I think we've got most of it. I think, I think we really I honestly have... think it's quite simple. I think I think it's quite simple and it really is just those main things that we've been bashing on about communication, collaboration, you know, picking your battles. And if you have advisors that you gel with, you know, through the whole process, then you're going to be informed and um, usually get, get a good outcome. Yeah, and I think the bottom line is surround yourself with the right people. I think yeah. that's the bottom line, you know, surround yourself with a team that uh, you become a team member of. You know, that team works with you uh, and you work together and uh, that you that you all have the same goal at the end of the day. You yeah. Know, as long as you're on the same page and, and make your tenants part of that team, you know. Yeah, which is a really interesting point because usually it's so, from the legal perspective, it's so this side, the other side. So that's really interesting. I always say to my, my clients, your your tenants are your customers effectively. Mm. You know, and if you're in sales, um, what do you want to do with your customer? You know, the saying was uh, your customer is king. Well, you don't want your tenant to be king, but you do want to be on the same page with them and, uh, you know, be working um, achieving the same goals together mm -hmm. in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So I think this has been unbelievable. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you about this. Uh, thank and you I, for having me, Mish. <laughs> like I say, we're definitely going to have you back on. I think there is so much um, in the uh, legal um, scenario, in the, in the legal uh, realm to, to discuss and to share with our audience. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge uh, and you're a lot of fun as we go through it. So we're definitely going to have you back on. <laughs> Thank you. No, I would love to come back on. So if anybody would like any information going forward on what we've been discussing here, uh, jump on. Uh, we do have a QR code if you can see the screen. If you can't see the screen, then just go to revolvecommercial.com.au. There's a free wealth grow plan. Uh, if you're new at this and you want to know whether you qualify, Click on a couple of those buttons. There's there are heaps of free information on that website. There's case studies. Um, there's due diligence lists. Um, there's a webinar on the difference between residential and commercial. I want to say thank you, Shasta, very much for joining us. Um, we have your information on the screen. And if anybody would like to reach out to Shasta, you can either contact us at revolvecommercial.com.au or go directly to Shasta on 1300 967 925 uh, and Shasta expect your phone to be ringing off the hook. <laughs> love that for us. <laughs> or you Thank can you. go to uh, legallylaw.com.au or drop Shasta an email at uh, Shasta at legallylaw com.au. Shasta, are there any other uh, contact details where people can contact you, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn, anything like that? Yeah, so I've got my Instagram handle legally underscore Shasta. So that's a good place to get in contact. Otherwise, give the office a call. I mean, I'm, I'm always here. So always happy to have a chat, no matter where people are in the process, really. It's just always good to have an idea of of the process so happy to happy to chat through that with people fantastic and thank you again um, for being available for joining us i know you're incredibly busy and it was very difficult to get this time with you so um hope you guys appreciate it and uh yeah hope to see you again very soon <laughs>